from the heart of California's Silicon Valley. That is the agreed upon order of operation. New technology is revolutionizing the way students learn. I didn't think it would happen this way, especially this fast. It's all thanks to a Bangladeshi American who turned his back on Wall Street. So this is where the magic happens. This is where some of the magic happens. <laughs> Can Salman Khan achieve his dream of a better educated, more competitive America? We'll talk to him next on Conversation With, U.S. Election Special. Hello from San Mateo in California's Silicon Valley. I'm Simon Marks. It wasn't that long ago that no one had ever even heard the phrase Silicon Valley. It was coined back in the 1970s when America's semiconductor industry started basing its research and development operations south of the San Francisco Bay. Then, with the home computing revolution of the 1980s and 90s, this part of the world really took off. Google, Twitter, Facebook, they all set up shop here, turning this region into the pulsating heart of American innovation, a bright spot on an otherwise languid economic landscape. Today, there's another revolution underway here, one that wouldn't have been possible without the earlier work of companies like Apple, IBM, Microsoft and Dell. And this one is already transforming the way in which people all over the United States and around the world do something as simple as learn. Did you ever think when you got started things were ever going to grow this big? Uh, I, I read a lot of science fiction books, so I hoped and dreamed, but I didn't think it would happen this way, especially this fast. It is the Khan Academy, named after its founder, 36-year-old Salman Khan, a Bangladeshi American who quit his day job as a hedge fund manager and became a YouTube sensation. One plus one. And I think you already know how to do this, uh, but... I'll, I'll kind of show you a way of doing it in case you don't have this memorized or, or you, you haven't already mastered this. His freely available videos, and there are now over 3,000 of them, have been watched 180 million times and reach 5 million students a month on the World Wide Web. They cover an enormous range of subjects, from basic maths to university-level courses on the laws of physics. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And they have a global audience and are now available in 17 different languages. It all began when Salman Khan's 12-year-old cousin was having trouble with her maths homework. I offered to tutor her remotely. So she was based in New Orleans, which is where I grew up. And so uh, she agreed that when she would go back every day after work for me and after school for her, we would do a, a remote tutoring session. And so we started doing that. Long story short, in about two months, she had kind of gotten over that hurdle and actually gotten ahead of her grade level, and, uh, and everything was working out. Then I started tutoring her younger brothers remotely. And then about 18 months later, word had gotten around in the family that some free tutoring was going on. So I was tutoring on the order of 10 or, or so cousins and family members every day after work. And, and I actually already started writing a little piece of software um, to give them practice problems, and so I, I, so I as their tutor could keep track of what they were doing. And uh, a friend said, oh, this is really cool software, but you know, are you, he, I was telling him how I was having trouble scaling myself with the actual live tutorials. And, and he suggested, well, why don't you make some videos and put them up on YouTube? And, and I gave it a shot, and uh, that was 2006. November 2006 was the first video I uploaded. And uh, I now famously, my cousin's first point of feedback was that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. And I, I kept going. And uh, before long, it became obvious that people who were not my cousins were watching the videos. And they started to send letters. And uh, my, my wife will tell you I'm a sucker for positive feedback. So I, I kept going. But that's an incredibly bold leap, isn't it? I mean, parents all over the world encourage their children to become hedge fund managers. And here you are, a hedge fund manager, throwing it all up and saying, I'm actually going to put my future on YouTube. Well, I think it started off from a place where I never viewed this as a business. And frankly, I still don't view this as a business because it's not a business. And when it started off, it was for my cousins. I was getting kind of psychic reward from helping my cousins. 
And then when other people started using the videos and sending me thank you letters, I just viewed it as a really fun hobby. I had this day job working as an analyst at a hedge fund. I was doing just fine. And then I got to go come home and get these nice thank you letters and go into some math and science that I liked talking about or, or researching or, or, or teaching. Um, and, and it really just, that started to overtake my life. And then this thing rapidly scaled. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's like you, you learn about exponential growth in school and when you're growing from 10 to 13 people in a month, it doesn't seem that crazy that you grew 30% in a month. But when you grow from 100,000 to 130,000 people in a month or 1 million to 1.3 million people in a month, uh, then you start to realize what, what exponential growth is. And in case you're curious, yes, there is a Khan Academy video explaining the concept of exponential growth. Let's do a problem on exponential growth. Anyway, as the Khan Academy grew exponentially, so it became noticed by the educational establishment. And Salman Khan realized that he could do a lot more than simply provide teaching aids via YouTube. Once we uh, got a lot of notoriety and there were people who, who came out of the woodwork and said, oh, we'd like, to, we'd like to fund you. What do you think Khan Academy could be? That's where I said, look, I think the videos are great and we can translate them into many, many languages and, and we are right now. But I don't think that's a complete, that's a complete offering. I think we need to supplement that or they should be the supplement to interactive problem sets. We should have explorations, we should have data, we should have tools for teachers so they could use this, ways that this could complement a physical classroom. And so that's what, what most of our resources are being spent on. Khan Academy is most known for its, its collection of videos. So As the Khan Academy grew, its founder found himself being widely celebrated. His TED talk on how we educate our children has been viewed nearly two million times on the internet. And Bill Gates himself announced that his own children had used the Khan Academy videos to help them with their schoolwork and said he was amazed Salman Khan had been able to do so much with so little. So when you think about the educational establishment, I mean schools, institutions of learning, universities, they have large staffs that produce coursework and deal with students on a continuing basis. What have you got? We've got uh, the space here, which as you can tell is very fancy. <laughs> uh, no, we're, we're 35 people right now. Uh, on the content side, there's, I, I still produce videos, as, uh, and I do other things here in the organization. Uh, we have two art historians making art history videos, and then we have two other, I would call them closer to being real film producers. They do more edited, more highly produced videos, I'm still making math and science videos. And then the rest of our team is mainly software engineers, uh, teachers, education researchers who are helping interface with the outside world, seeing what we can learn from best practices that are happening out there and research and, and bringing it into the product. So when you do a, a YouTube video about, say, molecular chemistry, I mean, I understand that, that you know math, uh, but what do you know? What does Sal Khan know about molecular chemistry, and how do you produce that video? Yes, so that's the fun thing, and the challenging thing for, for me individually is, yes, there's some things that, by virtue of my background, I know reasonably well. There's other things that I've always wanted to know better, and this is, a, this is motivation for me to, to get better at it. So, for example, if I'm doing biochemistry, and uh, you know, I, I know it reasonably well, but in order to teach it, you have to learn it at a much deeper level. I will immerse myself in that subject. Any resource that I can get my hands on, whether it's textbooks, the internet, and people, people I know who are faculty members at universities, experts in the field, I'll ask some questions like, well, exactly why does A lead to B? I can get you know, why B leads to C, but this seems to be a gap that the textbooks aren't explaining well, and I need to be able to explain that really, really well. And then once I, I feel like it's really distilled in my brain and I understand it as intuitively as I understand math or physics or anything else like that, I'll make the video. And, and the really powerful thing is that we have kind of the whole world being our editorial. Uh, once, once I put up a video, uh, we have, within a day, we'll have several thousand people view it. And some are students looking to learn it, but many of them are teachers, professors, graduate students looking to maybe use it or even critique it. Sometimes they're not always friends of ours, but they'll critique it and, and we'll take those very seriously and we'll say, oh, is that a legitimate critique? Oh, it is. Uh, maybe we should make another video clarifying something. Maybe we should redo the video. So, so we do that quite often. We, 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 we're always looking at what people are saying. When we come back, the Khan Academy takes on its critics. Is it really as revolutionary as some have claimed? Stay with us for more of Conversation With, U.S. Election Special. It takes guts to be a pioneer. Bill Gates of Microsoft, Steve Jobs of Apple, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. 
They've all known that only too well. For every sensational success story Silicon Valley has produced, there are detractors who question whether the decisions made in this part of the world are necessarily changing life for the better. So this is where the magic happens? This is where some of the magic happens. <laughs> we have a large team and they're doing at least as magical things as I am. The amazing thing about Silicon Valley is that as technology has marched on, entrepreneurs like Salman Khan have built empires with minimal investment. A computer, a microphone, some software, and most of all, an idea were all he needed to get the ball rolling. And once it got rolling and millions of students benefited, he started thinking some more. Explain your philosophy of education, because in your conception, it's about a lot more than the kind of classic top-down, lecturer behind a desk, teacher in a classroom, students sitting in chairs, soaking up everything that they are told and then regurgitating it. That's exactly right. I, I don't think that the traditional lecture model is the ideal use of either a, a professor or, or teacher's time. I actually think real learning always takes place when the student decides to learn. And in a lot of college classes, that happens to be the night before the exam, <laughs> when they actually engage. And usually they have just their textbooks and their notes and maybe their friends to help them through that. But that's where a lot of the learning, or, or maybe learning, uh, uh, might take place. So uh, what I believe strongly is uh, people should be able to learn at their own pace. They should be able to get a solid grounding in basic subjects before they're forced to move on. Let's let someone learn at their own pace. The variable is how, the, how long they have to learn something and when they learn it. And what's fixed is that they have a high level of mastery. And if they have a high level of mastery, they have all their gaps filled, then when they go to the next topic, the more advanced topic, it'll seem almost, it'll seem almost intuitive. And in terms of the, the, the virtual and physical, we think that when, when people are in a physical environment together, they should be interacting with each other. They should be teaching each other, talking to each other, building things, working on projects. And so right now you have lecture halls where it's a passive environment. Students are listening, taking notes. A teacher is giving a, a lecture that they might have given many times before. We think a lot of that stuff can happen at a teacher's, at a student's own pace. And when they go to the lecture hall, or it won't be a lecture hall anymore, they can do peer-to-peer -peer interaction, they can tutor each other, they can t tackle hard problems together, and they'll have the teacher there to actually interact with them, to, to answer their questions and mentor them. That phrase, it won't be a lecture hall anymore, is for many educators a radical step, and one that flies in the face of centuries of classic teaching experience. As a result, Salman Khan has come under fire from some sectors of the educational establishment who question whether his philosophy can work. Yeah, you know, it's, it's both radical and not so radical. You know, throughout, I mean, the last hundred years, there have been examples of this. If you go to some of the top business schools in the world, they have a case method, which is essentially that students do their reading and preparation at their own time, and when they come together, they do not have a lecture, they have a conversation. But, but to what you're saying, it, I guess it could also be viewed as, as radical because right now a disproportionate amount of class time is that traditional lecture. Now there are some people who clearly view this as threatening. There was a, a widely read blog post on the Chronicle of Higher Education's website that said, the Khan Academy is great for learning about lots of different subjects, very nice, but it's not really adequate for learning those subjects on a level that really makes a difference in the world. Not so nice. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, that second part is a tough question, I think, for education generally. You know, when we're, when we're put Khan Academy aside, when kids are in physics class or calculus class, how many of them are translating that to their everyday life or, you know, or they're in, in, in biology class or whatever? And I think this is a question that Khan Academy and everyone across the education spectrum has to ask themselves, are these translatable skills? Are these skills that are meaningful for students? Uh, with that said, we don't think we're by any means perfect, and we're at just the very early stages of what we're doing. But I think you know, the, the, the students and teachers that are using them, they, they are definitely getting value out of it. I mean, you know, this is the, the 5 million students and the 10,000 teachers who are using it, no, no one's telling them to, no one's forcing them to. And so we kind of look to them and say, what, where are you finding value in the Khan Academy and where can we improve? But you know, to, to that point, we don't think it's a solved problem. I mean, I'm not going to say, oh yes, everything just works perfectly on Khan Academy and kids walk away with an infinitely deep understanding of everything. I don't think that's true of 
any education system, frankly. Um, but I think what we're going to try to do over the next year, five years, ten years, hopefully a hundred years, is just keep improving, keep iterating, so we can uh, strive after that goal. None of the criticism has held the Khan Academy back, and in the nearby California town of Los Altos, a real-time experiment is underway in the public schools to measure the impact of Salman Khan's ideas. Were there any parents out there who were worried about their kids being guinea pigs? So when Los Altos did it, they actually, uh, I think, rightfully offered their, uh, the, the parents, they said, anyone who wants to opt out can opt out. Uh, they had a, set, they had a kind of a, a meeting about it, and none of the parents wanted to opt out. They, they all, I guess, liked the idea. And, uh, and, and so there, there's been a lot of transparency with parents. And the one thing is, I mean, the, the district and all of the schools that are doing it, they're, they're being very careful. And, and we've been doing studies, and so we've been partnering with organizations to measure pre-test, post-test, how are these students doing. So for us, it's much more of, we care a lot about the data, and, and we are seeing pretty good improvement, and we're going to release a lot of that in the next few months. But for us, it's not a thumbs up or thumbs down. It's how do we iterate, how do we improve, how do we share best practices, even the ones where we are seeing results, how do we improve those results even more? How do we get the students more engaged? How do we get them further up their learning curve? When we come back, can one man help restore America's global competitiveness? Stay with us for more of Conversation With, U.S. Election Special. When you come to this part of the United States, you are always aware that, as President Obama recently asserted, America is a Pacific nation. Looking around the Bay Area, you can see the influences of Asia everywhere. And this state's economy is dependent in part on the trade that it does with its neighbors on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So at a time when the United States is dealing with a rapidly developing China and India rising, and sees its own public educational system slipping in terms of global competitiveness, can the Khan Academy help put the country back on track? If you look at the statistics, by any measure, the educational system in the United States is facing challenges. American students rank 25th in maths and 21st in science compared to students in 30 industrialized countries. More than 1.2 million students drop out of school in the United States every year. That's more than 6,000 students every school day. How critically is change needed in the educational system here? Oh, it's huge. I mean, education is the core of everything. And I'll even, you know, and obviously the U.S. has issues being pretty far down the list, especially of wealthy countries in terms of how students are performing. But I actually think it's it's a global thing. Um, I, I think even in the top performing uh, uh, countries, they have far too many students who are struggling with math, struggling with science. I mean, in the U.S., it's at the level where at a lot of four-year universities, a majority of students are having to take essentially pre-algebra or having to take middle school math, which shows that they didn't actually get a lot out of, out of what they were exposed to later on in their careers. So, but I think it's universal. I mean, I think you go even some of the top performing countries, whether it's Korea or Finland or whatever, and you'll see tons of students falling through the cracks. And, and so we hope to help all of these students globally uh, not fall. But can the U.S. turn around its competitive disadvantage, especially when you look at countries in Asia, China rapidly developing, India rising? Is it possible for the United States to turn its educational system around and change that pattern? You know, one thing that I and our team is very careful, we've had ministry, ministers of education come to us and governors and say, oh, I want to mandate this in our state. And I was like, no, 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 don't mandate anything. Because as soon as you mandate it, it can be broken and it can be implemented badly. Any tool, a, a piece of chalk can be used well or it can used, be used badly. And at this stage, we did not want this type of thing. Actually, at any stage, what we want is the other way. We want it to be pulled. We want students and parents and individual teachers, the ones that are actively kind of on the ground, to say, you know, this is a pretty valuable tool. And I, you know, most, all, or if not all teachers, all students, all parents want the student to learn. And so if they see something happening, if their neighbor is doing something and that student is, you know, getting ahead or if it helped them out with their grades, that word of mouth, I think, is the strongest way to, to change things. And that's what we've been kind of, you know, our, our, our growth of the 5 million users, it's not a government telling someone you have to use Khan Academy. It's not, uh, it's, it's people telling each other, hey, this worked for my neighbor or this worked for my son, you might want to try it. If a private citizen, a non-governmental organization like yourselves, can play the role that you are playing in changing education. Is there a point at which people start saying, well, 
what role should the state actually be playing in educating its children? Um, that's something I, you know, I, I have no real opinion about. I, mean, I have an opinion of, well, uh, but to put simply, I think the state will always play a very strong role. I think public education is a very, very powerful thing. I, I think our role is to show cases where without extra money, without, with, with the resources on hand, you're able to move the dial. And if we can show that, and we can show it across use cases, whether it's affluent neighborhoods, underserved neighborhoods, different demographics, different geographies, then I think we will have done our part. And then other people say, well, it's just a matter of, do you adopt it or do you not? And, and especially if we lower all of the barriers to, to adoption. But yeah, I, I don't think, you know, we, I, you know, it's already getting a little political, us giving away free videos, educational videos. I, I definitely don't think it's even our place to go and say, this is the way public school should be, or this is how it should be funded, or, or anything like that. But Salman Khan feels sufficiently strongly that he's now gone into print. A bit of an old-fashioned medium, perhaps, but his new book, The One World Schoolhouse, codifies his call for students and teachers alike to be liberated from traditional thinking. It's been hailed by reviewers, including Al Gore, Muhammad Yunus, Bill Gates, and Carlos Slim. So this, in your mind, is about doing a lot more than simply lifting educational standards in the US. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, you know, right now our, our content is primarily in English, but it's already being used around the world. We're doing translations into Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Mandarin, Hindi, Bengali, uh, the top 10 languages of the world, and then we're going to go from there. Our goal over the next year is to localize the site so it's available in all of the world's languages. We've talked to people about how can we introduce more content on the site that could be regional specific, maybe if you want to learn a specific skill in a particular part of the world. So we really want to view this as like a an institution for the world so that Hopefully in 50 years, access to a world-class education will be like clean drinking water. It'll be, you know, it's not why, it'll be why not. And it'll be, it'll be ridiculously uh, inexpensive to deliver it to someone in a village that right now has no access to anything. So, so that is the goal, and I actually think it, you know, it'll help everybody if, if, if we can get there. The Khan Academy's growth continues. It recently introduced a course in computer science, and of course you take it using a computer. Add to that the summer schools, the partnerships with local school districts, and its growing visibility on YouTube, and things have come a long way since Salman Khan made a couple of videos to help his young cousins with their maths homework. So how far can all this go? Can Salman Khan genuinely create the global one-world classroom of his dreams? With Silicon Valley's track record of success and the wind of the information superhighway at his back, he at least thinks he's in with a chance. I'm Simon Marks from San Mateo in California. Goodbye.